That's a general principle for looking at the past in general. You don't excuse the immorality of the past, but it's very difficult and problematic to be the beneficiary of 2,500 years of material progress and moral improvement and have models of 2,500 years by which to emulate. And then suddenly say, well, and here and now, I judge you inferior in 420 because you don't meet my contemporary standards. That's one thing that's, that's wrong about that. The second is, as I said, you don't have to be perfect to be good. You, you have to say to yourself, compared to what? The other final, Philip, is this. We have no idea what people will say of us. So these very first critics of antiquity and say, we know they had slavery. Well, people are going to come by, back in 500 years and say, well, wait a minute. We've studied what 2023 was like in San Francisco. These very sophisticated, very liberal people allowed 7,000 people to inject, to fornicate, to urinate, and to kill themselves right on the streets of San Francisco. Defecate. How can they do that? That was medieval. Hello, my geeselings. This is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 112. And this episode is with Victor Davis Hansen, who is a renowned classicist, military historian, and political commentator. He is the Martin and Illy Anderson Senior Fellow in Residence in Classics and Military History at the Hoover Institution, which is here at Stanford. So it was absolutely terrific to talk with Victor for a number of reasons. But for one, as I just mentioned a few seconds ago, he's a classicist and historian. And if you've listened to this podcast much, you know that I love context and starting from the ground up in any discussion. And Victor is practically an encyclopedia. He has such a broad understanding of language, history, and society, culture. So it was great to be able to wade into these complicated issues with him. One of the biggest takeaways for me from the episode is that while on the one hand we can't forget the past, or if we do, it's at our own peril, we also can't judge it from our own moral high horse because we're soon to be displaced as well. And I think we are wrong to think ourselves in some objective sense, the moral superiors of our forebears. But anyway, Victor and I discuss his latest book, The Dying Citizen. And we start off with the origin of citizenship, which was the foundation of the first egalitarian society or civilization in ancient Greece, though, of course, there are some caveats there. Slavery is a big one, but we also talk about slavery and the we talk about the history of slavery. And that brings me back to what I mentioned a few seconds ago about judging the ancient Greeks based on our current uh, moral beliefs and intuitions. And then we turn into we turn to citizenship in the present and how it's failing. But you can keep up with Victor on Twitter uh, at VD Hansen on his website, victorhansen.com. It also contains a very nice blog or his podcast, the Victor Tavis Hansen Show. And there's a link to the Dying Citizen as well, which I highly, highly recommend. And without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Victor. You co-wrote a book many years ago called Who Killed Homer and then co-edited an anthology of essays called Bonfire of the Humanities about the factors contributing to the fading presence of classical studies in academia as well as the field significance. And the reason that I think this is important to discuss at the outset is you've written that classical antiquity is at the heart of Western civilization. And so I'm anticipating a, a connection between the dying classics and the dying citizen, and that the sorts of things we can learn from the classics might then buttress citizenship in the sense in which you use the term. So just what has happened to the classics and 
what is the field's continued relevance for your present minded thought? And I mean this beyond the sense in which you mentioned earlier that you were called upon for sort of military advice. Well, and very briefly, and John Heath and I uh, were worried about the status of classics, not just the death of the field per se, but the lack of pl classical learning and its role in civics or civic education or to giving to give the undergraduate or even the citizen at large some sense of the continuity of his or her institution. So they should understand there was a long history of constitutional government that started in Greece or personal freedom or free, the, the notion of private property or empiricism or the ability to look at the natural world without religious exegesis necessarily. And most of our main characteristics of the American democratic experience have some elements, or indeed all of them can be traced back. And then we have more controversially said that there was not comparable systems in other societies, nor before the classical Greeks. We didn't mean that ethnically because the Mycenaeans obviously were Greeks and they didn't have this system. We know that they were a palatial pyramidal society. Their language was linear being. Greek language, but a different script, et cetera, et cetera. And so we had forecast that. And then from that point that this discipline was essential in the schools, and we had all grown up with it, maybe not explicitly, but we were told democracy, this is democracy, this is the house. This is the Senate, this is the executive branch, these are the checks and balance. All that goes back to Aristotle's politics or discussions of the Spartan constitution or the, the checks and balances of the Cretan constitution or the critiques in antiquity of direct democracy in Athens. But we were losing that and that would have an effect on the population in general, but more importantly, it would lead to relativism or that people would look around at the United States and they would have certain grievances or criticisms of the system without a context of what there was elsewhere or what there was before or what there could be after. And I guess that would be summed up as either you don't have to be good, you don't have to be perfect to be good, or you tell me an alternative that's better. Those types of practical questions. One of the things that was kind of disturbing, we predicted in that book that if philologists continue to be so narrow and esoteric and not connected with the larger society, that they would be poor advocates for their continuance and they would be eliminated. Nobody took that seriously at the time, but now we know that major departments such as Princeton have dropped the Greek requirement. And when you drop the Greek requirement, that's a euphemism for not needing classical scholars that know the language. And it's, it's, it's spreading. Howard University just dropped their classics department. That was renowned really because the African-American classicist Frank Snowden, who wrote a book, Blacks in Antiquity, he was, a, he was a landmark classicist. And when I was at Stanford, probably the most accomplished Latinist was Gregson Davis, an African-American. And so there had been a strong tradition that classics had been very valuable. And that was the premise on which I taught at Cal State Fresno. For minority students. But we were very worried that classics was not as generally thought just the study of Greek and Latin or 5,000 um, classics professors or, you know, eight or 9,000 majors. That's Those seem enormous numbers now, but 20 years ago or 25 years ago. That's what it was and it was, it was dying and we thought there would be re repercussions uh, on the society at large. And I had no idea, to be frank, that the woke revolution or the uh, the, the anti-Western civilization movement or the anti-civics idea or the foundational date of the United States or the iconoclasm and attacks on classical architecture or sculpture, I, we, we, didn't, we didn't think it would ever get that bad, but it did. And it was very interesting to work with John Heath because he had a natural sense of humor. I was a little bit more serious in a sense of dull, but he he had a he, he wrote he had another life as well. He wrote 
uh, operas for children, and he was very successful at it. And some of the titles of his books are, are well, of his operas and musicals are very well known K through 12. So he, there's a lot of funny things in there in that book that uh, I thought was pretty good. Mm -hmm. You said that you, you didn't anticipate the sort of cultural developments that were uh, witnessing today. I'm sure that if you wrote those two, well, if you wrote the one book and edited the other anthology today, uh, they would be quite, quite different. But you mentioned that the checks and balances, um, the Senate, uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but a certain degree of equality among residents and citizens goes back to the classical period. And just to play devil's advocate before we move on, since I saw that this was uh, a criticism that you addressed in one of the books, how do you respond here to the the criticism that Greek societies often employed slavery. Uh, they were rigidly hierarchical in other ways that we would deem inhumane in the West today. And so that maybe we shouldn't laud them in the way that you do. Yeah, well, there's this term, what about, what about -ism you're hearing a lot, but what about -ism? Yeah, what about -ism? So when, rather than answering the question, you say, what about them? And what I'm saying is I'm going to employ it because if you can name one society, contemporary society, that did not have slavery, I'd like to know because there was none. And the word slave, as we know, comes from Slav. And that refers to the rise of the Seljuk Turks and the Ottomans in the 13th century in Anatolia and all the way up to the 19th century, who probably enslaved over 25 million people. Most of them were from the Balkans. And most of them were from southern Russia and around the Black Sea. And then the Arab world imported into uh, the Middle East, probably somewhere around 15 to 20 million African slaves. And then you had Europeans importing about 11 to 12 million to the New World. But And then you had slavery endemic in Africa as well. So I can't think of a society contemporaneous with the Greeks that wasn't slave, nor can I think of any society at the time that had a sophisticated critique of slavery. And that can be found in the plays of Euripides. Uh, the famous rhetorician, Alcadamus, has a famous quote, uh, God made no man a slave. In fact, I used that for uh, a number of articles. Then you have the uh, the liberator of Pamenondas in 362, uh, 370 BC, excuse me, he led a huge Pan-Hellenic army down into Sparta and he freed the Messenian Helots. They were serfs-slaves. That was, and he was a great liberator and he was considered by Cic Cicero, for example, the greatest man that Greece produced for that act. There was a big contention about the morality of slavery because you can see it in Aristotle's politics and ethics when he, he advances this idea that there's such a thing as a natural doulos, a natural slave. And what he's replying to is implicit criticism that that slavery uh, is somehow unjust. So he's trying to come up with an exegesis that says, well, some people are naturally servile, so they're better off as slaves. And that, well, that was very influential because the, the, the antebellum South used that bogus argument. To justify racial slavery. The other thing to remember about slavery, it was insidious in the in the ancient world. By insidious, I mean it was systemic, and but it was not based on race. And so it was an equal opportunity in slavery. Plato at one time was, we were told, was temporarily a slave. It was mostly from people who were captured in war. And there was no intellectual or moral baggage invested other than what Aristotle was reacting against. One of the reasons he was reacting against it was he was upset, supposedly, that there were very brilliant mathematical teachers, geometry teachers that were slaves, Greek slaves. Romans conquered them in the third century, second century BC. It was kind of, it was very prestigious to get a Greek slave that was very learned, much more learned than his Roman master. But my point is, unlike later slavery and from the 15th century on that was race-based, there was no investment that the slave was naturally 
inferior to the master. And that made it much harder to eradicate because anybody at any time, anywhere could be a slave. And there was no, there was no protection against that. So when, what I'm getting at is if you were in the fifth century and the slave said to the master, well, I'm a student of Pythagoras and I understand Democritus' atomic theory and I'm teaching your children and you're, you're, you're you don't know any of that. So why am I a slave and you're not? And the answer would have been, because you're unlucky and I'm not. And it's your fortune to get captured. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Sorry, that's the way it goes. That's much harder to eradicate because there's no investment in a pseudo principle of inferiority based on race. But when you have what racial slavery was both a late development in the Western world, but it was also the beginning of an easier way to eliminate it. So when the Europeans came to Africa in the 15th century, 16th century, and they came in sophisticated navigation and they had firearms, and they, they equated their technology with, with superiority. And they said, these people are inferior. The Arabs did the same thing. The Ottomans did the same thing. And they enslaved people on the, system, on the principle that they were inferior. But once they brought them to the new world and there were people who had some, you know, Frederick Douglass or some people have access to education and they proved not to be inferior, then that put the entire premise of slavery into question. And it was easy to eliminate because you say there's no moral reason that this person should be a slave or not because you're not doing what the ancient Greeks said. The ancient Greeks said, we don't need it. It's just luck. It's some people are short, some people are small, some people get sick, some people get slave. And that was the problem with getting rid of it. It was much harder to say it was wrong. But there were people who did say it was wrong. Hmm. Well, just to clarify, because I think this is exceedingly important in light of uh, contemporary revisionist history, am I right in saying that what I'm hearing is that the Greeks were revolutionary in many senses and very forward-thinking politically with regard to equality, uh, despite the slavery. And we should judge the shortcomings that we see now in the context of the time and even the centuries after, and not at all against our contemporary moralizing. Yes. I think that's a general principle for looking at the past in general. You don't excuse the immorality of the past, but it's very difficult and problematic to be the beneficiary of 2,500 years of material progress and moral improvement and have models of 2,500 years by which to emulate. And then suddenly say, well, in the here and now, I judge you inferior in 420 because you don't meet my contemporary standards. That's one thing that's, that's wrong about that. The second is as I said, you don't have to be perfect to be good. You, you have to say to yourself, compared to what? So if there's slavery in the Aztec civilization, and that we know that when the Spanish conquistadors landed in Tenochtitlan in 1519, there were things that were familiar. They had Slavery was on the way out in 1519 in mainland Spain, but they did have African slaves and they brought with them. They didn't object to the slavery, but they objected to cannibalism and they objected to human sacrifice. And so, in the Spanish way of saying, they would say, well, we have slaves, they have slaves. We have hierarchies, they have hierarchies. We can have intolerant religion, but we don't sacrifice people and we don't eat them. And so, what I'm getting at is that people tend to focus on the West and they have no, they don't use a comparable method of adjudication with other cultures for a variety of reasons. The other final Philip is this: we have no idea what people will say of us. So these very first critics of antiquity and say, we well, you know, they had slavery. Well, people are going to come by, back in 500 years and say, well, wait a minute, we've studied what. 2023 was like in San Francisco, these very sophisticated, very liberal people allowed 7,000 people to inject, to fornicate, to urinate, and to kill themselves right on the streets of San Francisco, defecate. How can they do that? That was medieval. Or they may say, 
wow, they were aborting children that they should have known that the child gives of sophisticated technology might have been able to live outside the womb at two and a half months, three months. They had that sophisticated, and yet they were terminating that child with a heartbeat. We don't know what they're going to say, but they're going to say something, and it will likely be critical. So it seems to me it's people should have a little bit of modesty and humble, a humble attitude to to think that they're not going to be exempt from the same type of scrutiny. It's in, inherent to the West. Remember that, that Western civilization is the only really sophisticated, self-critical society. That's, that's innate in, in Thucydides, Aristophanes, Aristotle, Plato. They tear, they tear each other apart. And I don't know if that's true of the Chinese tradition or the African tradition or the Native American tradition to the same degree, at least in the abstract. There's a quote that often comes to my mind in uh, in the context of subjects like this, and it's this art historian, Roy Sieber, who said, and we'll see if I can get it right, but the history of taste is a story of constantly shifting attitudes which are neither inevitable nor infallible beyond the moment in which they are in favor. The idea being just what you expressed, I think, that we constantly think we're at the apex of taste or morality or whatever it is, and we neglect the likelihood, uh, not just the possibility, but the likelihood that our tastes and attitudes will change. And in this case, when they change, we will then become the object of the future's ire. Yeah, we will. And one thing that's missing, one, I think, important point is that we are the beneficiaries of a sophisticated material in scientific culture. So when we talk about the illiberality of the Greeks or the Romans, we, we're talking about things that we have no comprehension. And that is, I was born with two 400, 20 400 vision. If I was in Greece, I'd be dead by now because I wouldn't be able to see. I've had three kidney stone operations. I would have been dead in each one of them. I had a ruptured appendix. I would have been dead. I had a serious sinus problem and a, a catastrophic bike accident. I would be dead. And so when we look back at these people, 90% of them were connected to agriculture and their chief worry was not a philosophical questions as much for most people. How do I live for tomorrow? The people who are criticizing the past have no idea that how would, how would people today live if they have no refrigerators and electricity? They would have to get food every 24 hours. They'd have to learn to cure them. Or most of what they take for granted in medicine, food, shelter, security, they wouldn't be there. And yet these societies were very sophisticated uh, technologically and abstract, but they, they fought against the physical world in a way that's just incomprehensible. So we get this dilemma or this paradox of very comfortable, mostly uh, le leisured and academics in the lounge, and then they're going back and just tearing apart people of the past that were one day away from death or, or, or murder or a violent end of somehow. And it, that, that, that's something that everybody has to take into consideration. Just basic thing. Uh, if you told today's most severe critic, and you said to them, for the next week, you're not going to have any toilet paper. You're not going to have a refrigerator. You're not going to have any electricity. You're not going to have any car. You're not going to have any medicine. And you're going to have to go out and let's stay in your neighborhood and survive. That means you're going to have to find game. You're going to have to grow food. You're going to have to protect yourself from a wandering tribe. And we know that you guys are interested in apocalyptic movies. Well, that's what the ancient world was like. If you were in a Greek city-state, you never knew who was coming over the hill. And you had to close the gates by darkness and make sure the walls held. That's a very different system or environment in which to operate than ours. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been, I'm, I wasn't really anticipating to get into this subject, but this has been really great. I think I'm, I'm ready though, to turn to the dying citizen. And I, I'd like to start with the basics. And the first thing is how is it that you're defining a citizen in this book. Uh, you cited Kant's thoughts on the privileges of citizenship in the Western world at the outset of the book, and I found that pretty helpful. 
Well, I try to distinguish the idea of a citizen from a resident. And today in the United States, we have 330 million uh, residents. 50 million of those may or may not be citizens. I think about, about 25 are here illegally and 25 million, to take a rough guess, are here on green cards. And so traditionally, citizenship in the West gave privileges to people who had either been born to one or two parents, or they resided in a particular place, or they had legal sanction through a formal process of obtaining it. And then it had particular rights and responsibilities. And the rights in, in this country were that if you were a citizen, you could enter or leave the country legally uh, with a since 1930 with a passport bef before with a general sense that you were free to go or come back and live here. You were free, you and you alone could vote in an election, local, state, or you had to be a citizen. And you could hold office and run for office, and you were subject to military call up, serve the military. All of those now, I think, have been blended in with residency. If you are not a citizen, you go across, we, we've had 7 million people enter the United States since 2021, completely against formal law statute but there's no consequences and they're living here. And we have the greatest number of people who were not born in the United States ever, both percentage wise and in, in actual numbers. California, 27% of the population was not born in the United States. And so then you say, well, what rights do they, they can get um, formal entitlements from the government? Uh, they can get free legal service. The city of San Diego is now offering them free legal services to sue the federal government for enforcing federal immigration law when they live in a sanctuary city, so that was the argument. Can they vote? Uh, ostensibly not, but in school board elections in San Francisco and in Massachusetts, people who are not legally a citizen are not a citizen, are, are voting. And because of the laxity of laws in which suddenly 70% of the electorate does not vote on election day in many states, and the error rate has gone from about 5% average rejection of ballots down to 0.4, there's, this, I think, a defensible assumption that a lot, a lot of people who are voting are not citizens and people are not worried about it. So in California, there's 10 million ballots that were mailed out and nobody knows where they are today. They go out to homes automatically. You go in California, you go to the DMV, you go to the unemployment office, you go to get a building permit, you're going to get uh, an, a ballot registration form in the mail. And there's going to be no audit you can get, and you will have ballots sent to you. I have children that have moved out 10 years ago, and every once in a while, I'll still get a ballot from them. And there's no audit at all. So I think that element is breaking down. I think. You can serve in the military if you're here. If you're not a U.S. citizen, you can serve in the military if you're here illegally. The only thing that I think now that separates a citizen from a resident is so far the citizen alone can hold elected office. And I don't know how long that's going to last. And so that sort of prompts the question, what's the purpose of citizenship? And you can really see that in the 1986 simpson mazzoli Immigration Act that Ronald Reagan pushed through. And, and the idea was that if you applied for citizenship, you get a one-time amnesty if you were here illegally in return for having I, everybody from now on would have an I-9 form and you could be deported if you broke the law. It didn't happen that way, but that was the idea. But the point I'm making is of those eligible who are here illegally, eligible to have a pathway to citizenship and go through the process was pretty streamlined. Only 30% applied. The other, the other 60 or 70% apparently shrugged and said, I don't see the advantage of it. I get everything I need. And where I live in rural Fresno County, I would estimate that on my avenue, half the residents are not citizens. And they tell me that. And then Every once in a while, somebody will ask me, 
can they go to Canada or they can, can they go places other than Mexico without being a citizen? And they have driver's license and uh, without being a citizen. So that it's no longer, and that then leads to a series of questions. Can you have a cohesive citizenry with a shared body of history and civic knowledge? And if you're not teaching this in the schools, when you meet somebody, when I'm walking around my farm at night and I see somebody and I say, this is a nightly occurrence, they speak no English. I have no idea if they know what the Battle of Shiloh is. If I said, what do you think about Gettysburg and the Fourth of July? It would be nothing. That's not new in America. We used to have a lot of immigrants come, but they came legally and they were they were unwilling participants in what we know as a brutal bargain. They were assimilated, integrated, intermarried, whether they liked it or not, on the kind of the Neanderthal premise that if you didn't want to be an American, you wouldn't have come here. And so you ask us, to come so you came and so here's what you got to do and we we force fed them americana and it worked pretty well and then we 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 in the last 20 years we jetsoned that assimilationist melting pot and we went to a tribalist salad bowl where each each particular ethnic group could retain not incidentally not food culture music but essentially their culture where they really were not interested in following the tenets of American citizenship in the sense that we all had certain dates, certain customs, 4th of July, certain protocol. You stood up for the flag, you cheered the American team. If I go to a soccer match and uh, the Mexican national team is playing in California, it, likely that it will be cheered and the American team will be booed. Famously, that happened, I mentioned that earlier in Los Angeles, where the entire Coliseum was booing the American team because they were residents that were Mexican national. So all of this is a matter of degree. We're reaching a, a tipping point where the number of people who have some idea what citizenship entails, responsibilities, and the knowledge of their ancestors and their protocols is now the minority and when that happens there's no reason for the system to continue historically it doesn't continue when people are a link that is not connected to the next generation from the last generation mm -hmm. you you said a few minutes ago and i just want to clarify this briefly that the way that you see it elected office is the only thing that separates a, a citizen from a resident today is it fair to characterize, just to sum up, what ideally characterizes citizenship is uh, maybe the the rights to freedom uh, within the confines of the law, and then to equality in the eyes of the law, and then the freedom to pursue one's own path, maybe to prosperity, uh, free of compulsion? Well, the Supreme Court I think in the 1960s, but it was reified again, ratified in, in the 1970s, it said that the Constitution applied not just to citizens, which it had been exclusively so, but to anybody who was a resident on U.S. soil. So you walk across the border and almost immediately you're protected by the Bill of Rights, search, search and seizure. You have the same constitutional rights as a U.S. citizen. So on my avenue, we have a, a, a big problem with gangs, Norteños, Serenos, M13. But when they're raided, and they're raided a lot by the sheriff's department, they have to have a warrant when they arrest people who are not citizens. So, and I see we have a bad habit of people who are intoxicated and because they don't have legal status and they feel that they don't want to come in contact I don't know why, it's no ramifications, but if they run off the road and take out five almond trees on my farm and they abandon their car and they're running away from it and I take the car with my tractor and I tow it and to pay for the $20,000 of damage, the highway patrol will come and say, that person has constitutional rights to property. You have no right. You have no right. I said, "Well, how about the losses? Can I use that?" No, 
and they take it and they have threatened to arrest you if you don't, they will take the car and impound it and wait and then they will notify you that the owner's name has assumed possession of the car that ruined your armor. And you have a legal right to sue them, but they're not they're not facing any penalties. They have the same rights as you do as far as court procedure, et cetera. I can testify from personal experience. So that's the idea that freedom, freedom of speech, protection from go- government coercion, uh, right to bear arms, that's all protected regardless whether you're a re- your, your feet are on the ground legally or you're a citizen or you're a legal resident, it's all the same. That's not a distinction that I can see between a citizen and a resident. It is a distinction of people who were lucky enough to have two feet within the borders of the United States, which I think is, again, a reminder why borders are really important. Because the more, if you don't have a border, this American idea that's happened to every system, it, it's, you can't keep expanding it. It dilutes from the center if it's not cultivated and nourished. So if you don't have a, a border with Mexico, where does is, where is the American system exist? 100 miles south, 200 miles north, who knows? And it's elastic. And that you, this idea that you can create an American system all over the world is sort of an utopian progressive dream, but it, 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 it's, impra- it's impractical or impossible in the real world. So the, the problem I think as I hear it laid out is that residents enjoy the benefits of citizenship, but then they don't have to endure, maybe that's not the right word, but they, they don't have the same obligations that citizens have. And this causes problem. Is that? I have to make a distinction. They are subject to U.S. sales tax if they have a job, even though they're illegally and are not supposed to be working without legal sanction. They have deductions that go into the Social Security system or the income tax system. However, they don't feel necessarily that they're Americans and they have no legal, no educational, no spiritual moral obligation to identify themselves first and foremost as America. So in my experience, I think it's documented throughout that when you have 50 million people here who were not born in the United States, and you're not making any systematic effort to assimilate or integrate them other than what popular culture does. And that is, to be honest, it, it does assimilate people through music. And they're not required to learn the English language because we have everything translated. Or then you're going to meet a lot of people who don't have the same reference as you do, or that they don't have the same collective memory as you do. Legal immigration is wonderful. It's helped the United States, but it's all always been predicated that it would be a minority of the population because you would need the majority to inculcate them and say, this is what San Francisco used to look like 20 years ago. This is what it was in 1950, and this is what it is now. Or this is why we, yeah, I know you're shooting off fireworks, but this is why you're doing it today. This is why. I've had that experience where somebody has let off firecrackers and explosive devices or shotguns and they've come over to my property. Kind of scary. When you shoot up in the air, the bullets come down. And I've gone over there politely to suggest they not do that. And after all, it's 4th of July. It's a celebratory event and they don't have no idea what I'm talking about. What do you mean? So, uh, that's kind of a pastime of conservative media to go on the streets of the United States and ask people what World War II is or who uh, Franklin Roosevelt and 90% of the people, unless they selectively edit, don't know. But as a person who taught, still teaches, but especially 21 years in the Cal State system, I can tell you that there's a large number getting growing larger every day that has no idea uh, if you were to ask them. These are students in college, not high school, college, high school graduates and potential college. If you ask them what the Supreme Court does, 
or who was Earl Warren or what was the Battle of Iwo Jima, they have no idea. None. Period. Still. Returning again to a, a broader historical context, this might seem like a superficial question. I hope it isn't uh, because I don't think the answer is at all obvious uh, since quite likely for the vast majority of human societies, citizenship hasn't been the norm. But just why ought it to be preserved? Why is it something that is so worth fighting for? What are its most crucial benefits? And why is the dying citizen uh, such a concern? Well, nobody has really been able to explain why it was that this colony in the United States, uh, more so than Canada, more so than Mexico, more so than anywhere in the world, exercised such influence and power that it wasn't commiserate with its size. I mean, it's 6% of the world's population. It's the most powerful country in the history of civilization. If you go back to classical Anicenes, for example, the historian Polybius was asked that question about Rome specifically. And he said it was because of their constitution and the idea of Roman and citizenship. What he meant was that there were checks and balances through a tripartite system, executive, two consuls, tribal councils, and the Roman Senate, and then legates and judicial, tribal um, courts and regular courts. And this, this, sent, this gave a sense of stability in the Republic and allowed people to pursue economic uh, pursuits without uh, coercion from the government, contract, rule of law, and then later the Justinian Law Code. And that was a secret. Same here with the United States. We have a stable uh, constitutional system and we inculcate its principles to the citizens who then were taught how it worked and how they, they had civic rights and responsibilities. And then more importantly, and this is more controversially, that this system was designed, as its critics point out, by upper middle class, if not wealthy, white male uh, Virginia plantation owners, some owning slaves, some not. and. 95% of the non-indigenous population were white males. But what they don't tell you was, unlike the Spanish colonial system where you would not be allowed to immigrate into Mexico or South America unless you were A, Spanish, and B, Catholic, there was no limits on who could come. Anybody could come. And tribalism and human nature being what it is, obviously the nation was British, and then Scottish, and then Irish, and then it started to open up to people from Western Europe, French and Dutch, Dutch early as well, and then Germans, and then Asians, and Eastern Europeans, and Jews. But in each, each iteration, of course, the original population was biased and prejudiced. But the system that they created was inherently contradictory to their own biases because no sooner were they trying to exclude people, which sometimes went on for decades, then someone would say, but wait a minute, to quote Martin Luther King Jr., I'm not being a radical, I'm just holding you to your own principles that you created. All men are created and equal. I didn't think it up, you did. And so that, that inherent nature of the United States allowed it to create uh, Americans that had no superficial resemblance culturally, ethnically, racially, to the people who founded the country, but could share the same aspiration. And that's why this country and citizenship were so valuable. And I, I can't see a model anywhere else. The other thing about it was, because everybody was originally an immigrant, and Americanism was an, a way of thinking, and very soon trans, I guess you would say, transmogrified from being an Englishman who became an American to anybody, then it was very elastic and expansive, and you could get enormous numbers of people who were talented, and their race became incidental. With African Americans, it took the longest, and anybody that was the most distant from the original core, because people were 
birds of a feather, I guess, flock together. But it, the logic was such that people can, and I think they do now, have equal rights with people who look exactly like the people who created the system. And that was the intent of the founders. They wouldn't have written that. And that gave the United States enormous advantages, both getting talent and uh, eliminating tribalism or ethnic, I guess, intolerance. And so, and, and what I mean, I'll, I'll give you one practical example. If you or I want to become a citizen of China, we, we're not going to ever be accepted. If we want to be a citizen of Uganda, we're not going to be accepted. I can tell you, if we go down to Mexico and we ask for Mexican citizenship from the people I talk to, who you'll never be fully accepted as a Mexican. You won't be able to run for office and become the president of Mexico with blonde hair and blue eyes. It's not going to happen. But it will happen in this country that the people who become president or high elected officials may not look anything like Thomas Jefferson or George Washington. And if anybody can think of any other place in the world, maybe the outside of some on place in Europe, I'd be happy to hear about it. And that that's what's so ironic that some of the most fierce critics of this system, they ne never go to the next level and say, America's racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, xenophobic, and it should be like this system. And they never do that. And I, I don't understand that. I've been in every Arab country uh, in the Middle East, I think, every one. And I'm always fascinated when I ask them how such rich countries can be so poor or so unfree. And I'm, I'm always told if I meet a journalist or somebody said, We're, we hire our first cousin. That's how we do it. We fire our first cousin. Our first loyalty is somebody that looks like us. And when we see an American, I said, well, what do you, what do you think of America? We don't know what they look like anymore. We see them in Iraq. We saw them in Afghanistan. We don't know what they look like. So that's very different. Mm -hmm. This uh, comparison to other nations and their citizenship, and then also our discussion of revisionist revisionist history uh, brings to mind this this quote from your book that I found uh, quite thought-provoking. And, and you write that the more political and social disparities disappear, the more they become emphasized and exaggerated, and the more the state takes responsibility for ensuring parity. Is that because the closer we arrive to full racial, ethnic, class, gender, and religious equality, the more we're damned for nearing but not quite achieving our utopian ideals? think so. I, I think, I think I've spent a lot of time on the West Bank and in Israel, and I'm always interested in profiles of some of the most radical terrorists. I would, all, when I went over there 20 years ago, when I would, I wrote about it and I would always ask people both on the West Bank and in that side Israel world, or the people blowing themselves up, they must be, or the biggest terrorists, they must be the poor. Well, sometimes the foot soldiers were the poor or people who had, had mental problems, but the architects that were the most radical were very well off. And they resented most fiercely that they hadn't achieved in their way of thinking absolute parity. So we get to the situation in America where you have Oprah Winfrey from her $40 million estate in Montecito worth $2 billion, and she's interviewing Meghan Markle, I guess remotely, from the Duchess of Sussex's Montecito, $20 million, and they're comparing stories about oppression and how they weren't treated the way they wanted. And they are wealthier and more privileged than 99.9%, .9%, surely more than the people of East Palestine, Ohio, that had nothing. But because they feel that they have a claim against the majority, they can accentuate. I don't know if they do it for psychological reasons or career reasons, but two generations from now, people are going to think that's absurd. That very, very wealthy people who have done very well in the American system are still trying to suggest that the way they appear superficially, their color, their race is essential to who they are rather than incidental. And yet that happens. 
But, and, I'm, and I can tell you that it happens more when you are more privileged. So I have a kind of a schizophrenic existence still when I'm here at the Hoover Institution on the Stanford campus. I read literature. I look at posters. I hear students talking. I eat among students. And then I go to southern Fresno County where the per capita income is $14,000 a year. And if I'm on the farm or I have people that I see, mostly they're Mexican or Mexican-Americans. Very rarely do they talk about race. Very rare. They never, you know, they don't say this. But, but here, it seems to be, it's just obsessive. There's fixations on it. And that's mostly people who are, regardless of their race, are very well off and privileged and been beneficiaries of the American system. But the people who haven't seem to have transcended race much better. Hmm. Well, the... That quote that I read also uh, reminds me of Steven Pinker's thesis in The Better Angels of Our Nature that despite appearances, we are on the whole doing far better than we ever have. And it's due to enlightenment ideals and rationality. Though, of course, I mean, you trace these ideals back not to the historical enlightenment, but to Greece. But your thesis is also that we're in danger of losing this progress and maybe uh, ending on something more approaching a positive note. Do you see any ways in which we can preserve the, uh, the benefits and progress of citizenship and the forward march, I suppose, of, of government? Well, a couple of things. Human nature, I don't think, improves. It's static. It's fixed. And unless, Biologically entrenched. Yes. Yeah. Biologically. People are predictable. I don't know if you sit it in. You said, my history is going to be valuable because people in the future are going to be like us. And they can learn lessons in this context that they can apply to their own context. So that that's one thing. And we are the beneficiaries, no doubt about it, not just the technological constant advances, but also of moral improvement. So we don't have slavery, for example. But I'm not at all confident that any, I'm not a Whig historian. I don't believe that there's a natural order of progress that can be defined by century upon century upon century. So we are, and I'll give you an example. We just got through an epidemic that killed a million Americans. It was done through American people in our government who routed money to Echo Health because it was illegal to pursue gain of function research, who gave the expertise that helped the Wuhan Virology Lab, which soon became under the auspices of the People's Liberation Army. From what the Sunday Times said in London this week, that group of virologists was experimenting on gain of function to probably create a bioweapon and can't be proven, but they were experimenting with gain of function uh, viruses that were much more lethal than SARS-2. And then if you, we can use the same train of thought and apply it to arf- artificial intelligence. So there was just a experiment that the U.S. Army released that a artificial intelligence program was built in to protect the the weapon, the missile weapon from being knocked down or to be destroyed prematurely before it hit the target. And in, the, in a simulation, the, the programmer or the director of the missile that was fired in a computer simulation pushed the kill button to stop it, to abort the mission. And the missile came back and reprogrammed itself and killed him because he was considered an outside threat to the mission. And they didn't realize that had not been part of the program. They thought they didn't even think that that would be possible. So what I'm getting at is when you look at virology or artificial intelligence and you add in mixture uh, human nature, I think that we are capable right now to surpass the gates of hell at Auschwitz easily. They had Zygon gas and a bankrupt uh, racial theory. But... I don't know what the theory behind the biology lab in 
China was, but they were also, according to Stephen Quay, who just testified before Congress, they were also working on vaccines that might have been DNA based. So they were thinking maybe there were some people, not the whole lab, obviously, but were thinking of a bio weapon that could be unleashed that would not attack their own population to the same degree. So we're getting into areas now that the ancients had no idea of the capability. And whatever we say about the past, they didn't have the technology or maybe the desire to destroy all humankind. We do. The other thing is that uh, I think we have to separate technology from culture and society. And I've read Steven Pinker's various theses. I I think, you know, obviously he doesn't think there's a contribution of Christianity, but it, it does seem to me that when I go and I travel a lot, so when I go to, I say in the last three years, I've been to downtown Portland, Seattle, Minneapolis, Washington, Baltimore, New York, Milwaukee, and Los Angeles and San Francisco, and I had been in those cities 10 years earlier. If I was a person from another planet and I had a series of criteria, do people look at you and say hello to the same extent they did 10 years ago? Is the, the streets cleaner? Or the homeless treated better or worse? Is it safer or more dangerous? Or or there are greater variety of shopping when I go in and I need to get a quick prescription. I go to a drugstore. Are things locked up like a prison infirmary? Or were they open and accessible? Then I think by any measure, you could say that that's a retrogression. We're in decline, despite all of the accumulated wisdom. And so I think history is like this. And I don't see any reason why unless we invest in civic education, morality, and have some sense of transcendence that each person understands that there's something other than themselves. You can define that either, you know, like planting a walnut tree when you're 90, so your grandson will have walnuts, it'll, or your son will have walnuts, or you can believe in the Christian idea or religious idea, but you don't have any sense of transcendence, then I, I, I don't think you have any moral bearings. We don't, and we have a lot of people that don't believe they're transcendent. They're fixated on life extension or cosmetic surgery, or they think they can defeat the odds and live forever, and it's not going to happen. But so I'm kind of skeptical about that. And I feel that one of the reasons I wrote the book is I thought we were in one of these periods of retrogression, regression. And I, 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 uh, I think it was safer to walk the streets of America 20 years ago than it was now. I think people were more, they were kinder than they are now. I think racial relations were better than they are now in 2000. I think the students that I had were much better educated than now. I think if you're graduating from Stanford University this year or next year, you're going to know a lot less than you did a graduate 20 years ago. And that graduate was probably going to know less than somebody in 1940 that graduated. I can see it in my own discipline. When I read an article written about the ancient world in 2022, and I look at one that was written in 1940, 1950, and I look at the level of scholarship, knowledge of the classical languages, it's not even close. These articles today, uh, and th- these are with, com- with the aid of computer searches and all sorts of research techniques that were unavailable. It, they're not even close to the level of scholarship or erudition. So it's a mixed bag. I'm not, you know, Horace said every generation thinks that they are birthing a generation worse than they are about to gener- uh, birth a, uh, a generation worse than themselves. But, or I think he also said we're all laudatores temporis. Octi, we're all praisers of uh, a age that's past, you know, reactionary nostalgic. But there is something. I think it's very important to have that attitude because we all have a we all have had some kind of commitment or obligation to the generations before to continue the system and improve it. And just one generation fails that commitment, and things fall apart. One of the things you hear from people on the left, right, Democratic or Republican is they cannot believe how quickly things have deteriorated 
since 2020. And they can cite all different reasons depending on their politics, but they agree on one thing. They did not understand how fragile the United States was. And they didn't, nobody in their right mind in 2019 or 18 who was walking at one o'clock in the morning in San Francisco in a bustling, happy city with commerce and safety can believe what's happened so quickly. And these are, I get this comment from people who are on the left, I get on the right, I have different reasons for it, but they agree that it's downhill. Well, uh, the decline in scholarship is a completely different issue and one that's very fascinating and I'd love to talk about it, but sadly a, a topic for another time. So Victor, I, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, you've been you've been my first classicist and bona fide historian on the show and the perspective you brought was I mean, a, a great way to broach uh, contemporary problems and current events. So thanks again. Well, thank you for having me. Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, Please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already. Smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats, please do so.